I am really honored and jazzed to be here. First of all, because I really enjoy knowing Thomas Gorney and his organization and the wonderful people there. But I always loved business events because I'm married to a Harvard MBA who's a turnaround guy. So I'm sort of, I've received my MBA sexually transmitted, but <laughs> I, I, I can sort of understand where you're coming from. Um, as you know, in history, this is a pivotal time in history because we are now post-election. So depending on which side, you know, who you voted for, you know, you may be really elated or you may be really bummed out right now. But despite where you fit, it's, you know, there's a relief. It's over. The relentless campaigning is over. The obnoxious back and forth is over. And then there's a lot of reaction, obviously. It's time to reflect what happened, what we do different in America. And then the next thing that's up to all of us as Americans is, how are we going to respond? And for you in the business community, what is your response to that? Someone once told me that when you are in a crisis situation, uh, there is a Chinese symbol for crisis, and it's composed of two symbols. One stands for danger, and the other is opportunity. I think this is a good time to think, how does what's happened in history impact my life, my career, and what can I do about it? But what I want to do, because the White House and everything going on has been in the news recently, is talk about my nine years at the White House and how that's impacted me in my life and, and what I can do to share with you to, to uh, learn from that. I really believe it's the journey in our life that defines us and makes us the people we are. And I also believe that there are no accidents, that you meet people for a particular reason. You sit beside a certain person today, maybe you're meant to meet them. They impact your life in some way. So I'm going to share with you my journey. And I think a lot of times the best lessons in life are personal stories. The story I share really began in the Philippines. I, did not, uh, I was not born here. My father and mother are Filipino. Uh, they were raised in the Philippines. My dad joined the US Navy back in the 40s. I was born on a Navy base. And this is a photograph when I was two years old. I'm the second little girl from the left. And that's my maternal grandmother who used to sell fish in the market in their little village in the Philippines. Uh, when I see this black and white photo late at night, it really strikes me. It's like the care package photo, right? See it late at night. They show a picture of these little orphaned children in a third world country. It's like, oh my god, go get the checkbook. We're going to donate money to care. And, and that's really where I started as the underdog. I, I look at my cousins on each side of me, my t the two little girl cousins left the Philippines years later, uh, moved to Canada where they run a nursing home. And my little cousin, uh, Jose there, the only boy in the group, uh, also left, joined the US Navy, and retired in Pensacola. So everybody moved on. But it isn't where you start. It's where you end up in life. And my whole story really is the underdog. And I think a lot of you in business, you start off as the underdog, right? You're the person, oh, how am I struggling? What am I going to do? You're the underdog. And really, the American journey is that of underdogs making their way through. But it's also about fitting in. How do I fit in? And that's always been my mantra. I'm going to try to fit in. You know, and it's tough when your height, your face, your name, your gender, something about you doesn't fit in with everybody else or the status quo. And here I am on my fifth birthday. Uh, we lived in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in the, in the 50s. And I was trying to fit in with the neighborhood kids. Uh, they all wore the pink frilly dresses. In those days, moms made the birthday cake. And there I am with my cake. And, and there's my poor little brother who feels out of it because you know, he really didn't fit in with that group. So people used to say, oh, man, you're so disadvantaged. You, know, you grew up as a kid of an enlisted serviceman. And you know, you really, you know, your family sort of lived in the military ghetto, which is Navy housing. And I, and I look back. And it, it really isn't so bad being, quote, starting off disadvantaged, because you're always hungry for opportunities, right? You know all the rough things you went through. So now I'm really looking for opportunities to, to move beyond that. And I'm going to defy the odds, because every one of you, I'm sure, is a fighter. You wouldn't be in your, in your industry if you were passive and let things go. I mean, people who start up companies are not complacent people. You're trying to defy the odds. You're trying to do something to shake up the world. But when you find yourself in a situation, in a meeting, or dealing with industry, or something in your life where you're standing out, you're finding, oh my gosh, I'm not really fitting in, that's OK. Because that is your opportunity to be outstanding. People will remember you. There's something different about you that they will remember. I really was blessed because of opportunity. Coming to this country, growing up in the US, going to public school, because my parents couldn't afford private school, 
it really was through education. And uh, this was the last time I wore a young woman's long hair was in the 1970s, 73, my high school graduation in Imperial Beach, California. And my kids who are millennials sort of give me a hard time. They said, Mom, what's the big deal? Just because you were valedictorian of your high school class, very, you would know very well that was Imperial Beach, California, Southern California in the 1970s. And half your class was either stoned or drunk. But I said, no, I was a good Catholic girl, never inhaled, uh, got scholarships to undergraduate school at UC San Diego, and went to the military medical school in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And it was really through the military that shaped my whole view of working with people and with life in general. And through the military, really, I owe several things. I was very fortunate to have retired as a one-star rear admiral. But through that time, the 24 years, the military enforced on, upon me several things that really it isn't just a job. It really was the adventure, because you have to like what you do, even though you have some rough days. But it really was the adventure. And the other recruiting ad we use is be all you can be. And in the military, you weren't just a doctor. I got to be a ship's doctor. I got to run a division. It was about leadership. It was about working with people from all types and walks of life. What did I learn from the military? And what, what can you learn from the things I learned from 24 years of active duty? The number one thing is the mission comes first. And for people of business, that's your tagline. What's your goal? What's your product? Focus on that. And really, it's really the focus upon what your mission is. The other is your chain of command. It is about respect, not only for your client, but the people with whom you work. Take care of your troops. I never tell people so-and-so works for me. I tell them so-and-so works with me. We're a part of that team. I'm only as good as the person on the phone that's receiving the calls. And that's why your front line person is so important as the interface with your customers. Don't burn your bridges, and that is so true, especially in your industry. It's a small community when you look at how many people are there, but really it is small, and your reputation is important. If you have a negative outcome or a, just a bad encounter with someone in your group, word spreads. And you never know that that person that you met 15, 20 years ago, five years ago, that you may want to go into business with them. You may want to partner with them about a product. I mean, it, it really is about not burning your bridges. But in the end, it's serving a higher purpose, something that is bigger and better than you, and seek that higher purpose. How did I wind up spending nine years at the, high, at the White House? How did I even wind up at the White House? Well, I think in a lot of ways, it was perhaps by divine inter intervention. Let me give you a little bit of history. The year was 1991. I was living in San Diego, California. I was married to my first husband at the time, which is a totally different story, but that's for another time. And I was in the Navy, and I was division head for internal medicine. So that was an administrative job, but I was seeing patients every day, um, rounding in the, in the, on the wards at uh, a teaching hospital, and then seeing patients in clinic, and then go home late at night, take care of my husband and my two kids. And my husband at that time was an attorney. He worked at a law firm in San Diego. We lived three houses down from my parents. And on the surface, life looked pretty good. You think, oh, you had it made. You got a great job. Husband's working for a good law firm. Your kid's you know, going to a good school. But there was something in me that I wasn't quite happy with. I just felt unrest. And sometimes you, know, you may feel that, that on the surface, life looks good. Everything's going great. But you just don't feel that that was it. Is this all there is? And at that time, my 10-year commitment was almost up in the military. I had gone, I had had a full scholarship to medical school through the military medical school. So I owed them 10 years back. So my 10 years of payback was almost over. And I had to decide whether I was going to stay in the military and make it a life career or if I wanted to get out. So I was struggling with that decision. And my husband said, listen, my law firm is going on a retreat this weekend in Palm Springs. And why don't you come? And we'll have mom and dad watch the kids. And you, know, you may make the decision then. I said, good idea. So we went over to Palm Springs. And I remember uh, I had gone down into the grand ballroom that night. And I was really pretty much tired of working all day, you know, taking care of the kids at night and nonstop. And I had met the law partners. And they were all you know, male par law partners at the time. And then I turned and I met the wives of law partners. And it struck me that they were really not like me. They uh, got to stay home with their kids, take them to school. They were tan. They were rested. They had time for Pilates and tennis. And I thought, oh, I had an epiphany. I said, you know what? I've made my decision. I looked at my husband, I said, 
I think I know what I want to do next. And he goes, what? I said, I will get out of the Navy. You make law partner, and I will become a trophy wife. I really want to be a trophy wife. And he says, OK, I'll be supportive. So we go through the weekend, very nice weekend. I'm back at work on Monday morning at the Navy base. I go down to the Office of Personnel, and I ask them for the letters of, of resignation, or they call release from active duty. Because in the military, you can't just say, I quit, I'm done. You have to fill out the paperwork in triplicates, submit it to the folks in Washington, DC. And about nine months later, they say, OK, you're free to go. So I brought the paperwork back to my office. I'm sitting there filling it out. And it really strikes me I'm divorcing the military. Been in the military all my life. That's all I knew as a Navy brat. My dad was in for 30 years. Then I went to military medical school. Then I had 10 additional years on top of that. But if that's what it took. So I'm filling it out. And as I'm doing that, my phone rings. And it's my boss, the chairman of medicine, Captain Midas. And he doesn't know I'm trying to leave. And so I answer. And he says, hey, Connie, he said, I just received the message traffic from Washington, DC. And I'm to nominate five candidates for the position of doctor to the White House to represent the US Navy. And I said, I've, oh, I've never heard of that. He says, well, we have a doctor uh, at the White House now who represents the Navy. His two-year assignment is up. And I want to include you in one of the nominations among the five people. We have an Army doctor there, an Air Force doctor there. They represent the armed forces. You travel with the president. You take care of the first family. You take care of the president. You know, it's a two-year tour. And at the end of the two years, you, know, you get to pick wherever you want to go next. You can come back here. I said, well, let me call my husband. So I hang up. I call my husband at his law firm. I tell him about this change in plans. And the first thing out of his mouth is, are you nuts? You hate Washington, DC. You grew up there in the 60s. You went to med school there. You know very well it's hot and humid this summer. It's cold and miserable in the winter. But most important of all, they don't have good Mexican food like they do here in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, they got good food. Well, it's almost as good as, as Phoenix. But anyway, they don't have good, good Mexican food. And he says, I thought you were going to get out. I said, yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll tell him no. So I hang up. I'm getting ready to call my boss. And I turn, and my pager is vibrating. And it says, call me back. So I hang up. I'm not going to call my boss. I pick up the, you know, look at the number. It's my husband. I call him back. I said, what's up? I'm getting ready to call my boss. He says, you know what? It really struck me that you have nothing to lose if you decide to go through this process, because you'll never get this job anyway. Good, good response. I, I did divorce him 13 years later. <laughs> the lesson from this, the sidebar, two things. Number one, two important things in your life. I'm giving you life coaching advice. Number one, most important decision is, what is your calling in this life? What are you meant to do? What are you meant to be in this life? What is your life calling? Number two, your second most major decision is your life partner. Who is meant to be with you in this life? You make sure that person is your biggest fan and they elevate you. So as my first husband said, you'll never get this job anyway, but it is a good resume item in case you decide to work part time for Kaiser. I said, oh, OK, all right. Thanks for the faith. I'll tell my boss, go ahead and put my name in. So I put my, he puts my name in. Fast forward nine months. I'm in Washington, DC. It's Christmas time. They've decorated the White House. It looks gorgeous. I'm being paraded around the White House, being interviewed uh, by members of the White House Medical Unit, which is a huge team of military people, the security department, because you have to get a top secret security, security clearance so you can't kill the president. And I'm looking at my competition, the four other guys that the Navy sent along with me. And they're all, we're all military uniform. And I'm looking at them. And they, they all have nice hair, bright teeth. There are lots of medals. They all look like clones of Tom Cruise out of that movie Top Gun. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my god, that's a competition. I, there's no way I'm going to get this job. So we get paraded around, get interviewed by everybody. And the last interview for each of us individually is with the senior doctor at the White House. And at that time, it was Dr. J. Burton Lee III. Now, uh, b this was before Al Gore invented the internet. We, uh, we had uh, literature search. So I had done a literature search on Dr. J. Burnley III. Because as you know, if someone's going to interview you, you ought to know who it is, what their background is, so that when you talk, you can connect, you can have something in common. So you know, you've researched these people. So I did that. And I read his interviews that were in the Wall Street Journal. I had read some of his opinions. 
I just didn't get a good feeling. I thought, oh my God, I, I don't think he likes women. I don't think he likes minorities. I just don't have a good feeling. And I think, you know, I was trying to find something we had in common. And we had nothing in common. So I said, well, you know, I'm, this is not going to be a great interview because we had nothing in common. So uh, Dr. Al Roberts, who's the incumbent Navy doctor that we're supposed to replace, is, uh, again, walking us around. And, and so he brings me privately to the ground floor of the White House because there's a doctor's office there. It's been there uh, since the 1900s. And he says, all right, you're, you're next up to be interviewed by Dr. Lee. You have a seat. So I sit down. Dr. Roberts goes through this doorway that's connected to the private office of Dr. Lee. And he's, I can hear the following exchange. He says, Dr. Lee, I have our next candidate here. And I hear this male voice on the other end. Did you bring her paperwork, her resume items with you? Dr. Roberts goes, oh, I forgot it in the other building across the way, across West Exec. And all of a sudden, the voice goes really gruff. And I hear something thrown across the room. And I hear the voice go, well, never mind. I'll make the decision without it. Dr. Roberts pulls away from the door. He looks at me. He goes, you're on. <laughs> I said, wow. I thought, oh, my, that's a great warm-up act. So I take a deep breath, you know, you know the position of posture. <clears throat> you know, wipe your hands if they're sweaty. And I, I do something that I believe in. And what I did was I said a silent prayer. And this is what I prayed. I said, dear God, if this is meant to be, show me a sign. So I walk through the doorway. I go into the room. And I see Dr. Lee. And he's about 60 years old, very distinguished gentleman in a business suit. But as soon as I see him, it really strikes me. There's the sign. And what it was was a single tan Band-Aid right across his forehead. And at that time, I was a mom of two little boys. And my mommy eyes said, my goodness, he's got a boo-boo on his forehead. <laughs> so maybe that's like, be human, right? He can bleed. So he looks at me, good eye contact, shakes my hand, good firm handshake, looks at you. And then he points over to his desk in a chair beside it on the other side of the room. He goes, sit down. I went. OK, so I walk over. And what I'm thinking at the time is, man, this guy doesn't believe in foreplay. This is before Bill Clinton came to office. So I walk over, and I wait for him to sit down, because he's senior to me. So we sit opposite each other like this. And he launches right into my interview. First thing he asks is, why do you want this job? And you've all been asked that. You've asked people this. You've been asked it. Why do you want this job? Well, I had prepared all these politically correct responses. But you know what? What came out of my mouth was this. Dr. Lee, it's payback time. And he looks at me like, what? <laughs> I said, it's payback time. I owe a lot to the United States of America. My father was a poor man in the Philippines. He joined the US Navy in the 1940s. He was, became a steward in the Navy, because that's what they offered you if you're a person of color. And he brought us to the United States. I was educated here. I went to public school, because my parents couldn't afford to send me to private school. I went to the military medical school because they couldn't afford me to send me to med school. So I became a physician because of the US military and because of this country. And I owe a lot to this country. And if I can re repay my debt by serving the commander in chief, that's what I want to do. So I look at him, and there is no expression on his face. As they say in Vegas, as they say upstairs in the casino, he has a poker face. You know, can't tell what he's thinking. So I'm like, you know, not getting a good response here. So a few seconds later, he says, what can you do here? Well, at that time, I was a commander. I said, Dr. Lee, you see the stripes on my sleeve? I had my blue uniform on. I had three big gold stripes. The longer I'm in the Navy, the more stripes they put on my sleeve, the more they put me behind a desk. I'm not a desk doctor. I'm a trench doctor. You put me anywhere in the world, anywhere outside of a hospital, I can take care of patients. I can treat patients. I know how to do that. So once again, no response, flat affect, if we, as we say in medicine, or poker face. So I'm really feeling pretty bad. This is probably the worst interview. So a few seconds later, he stands up right in the middle of my interview. So I stand up. And he says, well, as far as I'm concerned, we can stop the process right now. And I thought, oh, my heart sank. This is the worst interview of my life. He said, I don't care who we're interviewing today or tomorrow. You've got the job. I'm going to tell Barbara Bush. He shakes my hand, he walks across the hallway, and I follow him out. He goes across the hallway, takes the elevator to the second floor of the White House residence to tell the first lady. Meanwhile, I'm standing there, and I'm like, you know, Dr. Roberts, who's there, and the secretary, like, looking at me, looking at their watch, what happened? I said, I think I got the job. So I love that story, number one, because it's true, but the messages are several. First of all, 
why do you want this job? And what he was looking for is my true authentic voice. And people will say, well, what, what do you mean, you know, what, what's the true authentic voice? And the, the words that I hear that come to me about how do you know you're speaking with your true authentic voice, it's when you no longer have to pretend. No pretending. Be who you are. That's what he wanted to hear. It also talks about the value of prayer and believing in a higher power and to show you and guide you. And it's about giving back. You know, I didn't say I'm here to make a lot of money or to be famous. No, I'm here to pay back the debt that I owe. So it's the higher purpose, the higher mission. That's how I wound up there. I was supposed to be a two-year assignment. Uh, President Clinton said, oh, we won real I want you to stay longer. So two years became four. Four years became eight. Eight years went to nine because I said, finally, I need to move on. My kids are, were you know, one in three when I started. They were 12 and 14. They spent their entire you know, childhood here. And I've been away because I tra you know, travel a lot with the president. So it was time for me to move to Arizona and have part two of my life. So that's how I wound up there, here. Taking care of the president. People will say, oh, it must be glamorous. You, know, you travel on Air Force One. You're with the president. You're at all the events. It looks glamorous. Uh, it is very humbling as a physician because you know we're so used to patients waiting on us. No, we w we wait on them. We wait on presents. One of the few jobs you follow your patient around, 24/7. You can actually watch them be non-compliant. So, <laughs> see what they're reading. You can nag them, smoking cigars when they shouldn't be, uh, running after them on a, a jogging course. It's also dangerous. Secret Service says you know the perimeter around the president. They have a name for that area, the, right beside the president. They call it the kill zone, the kill zone. Because if you're standing beside him and someone decides to shoot him, just think of James Brady with the ricochet bullets and everything, you get killed. And you can't treat the president if you're dead. So we train the medical unit, the doctor, the nurses, the medics, the whole team, that you're far enough away to see him work a rope line, but you're close enough to resuscitate him. So without giving away all the secrets of what we do, Doctor, the president will see you now. That's what the secretary or is that's the White House secretary will call you. You know, you, they don't say, you know, Mr. President, come on in. No, no, no. You are summoned to the Oval Office. And, and this was a, on a Saturday when Bill Clinton was running for re-election, and he had the media coming that afternoon to do some taping. And he had, at that time, Elv Evelyn Lieberman, God rest her soul, she died a year and a half ago, was uh, his chief of staff, a woman chief of staff, and she said, Connie, you need to get over here. The president's been vomiting. He's, you know, he has a stomach flu. So I came over. I'm doing a house call. Of course, everything's chronicle in the life. You have the White House photographer come over and take a picture as he's sitting there, and I'm talking. I said, how are you feeling? He says, I don't feel good. And I said, are you pushing fluids? And he points to that glass of water. I said, well, Mr. President, the glass is full. You are not pushing fluids. <laughs> and Someone will say, well, what do, you, what do you do if he doesn't want to listen to you? Because I said, listen, you need to take the day off. You need to call off the media. You need to go back into the house and rest. And you know, we'll put an IV if we have to. And he didn't want to do that. And so what do you do if the president doesn't want to do what you want to do? You appeal to higher authority. You say, Mr. President, I have no other recourse. I'm going to tell the first lady. <laughs> so you always go to higher authority. And I actually do that in private practice now if certain people, you know, as you don't violate HIPAA, and a lot of times my patients will come in with their spouse. You know, you look at the spouse and you try to get the agreement of the spouse to, to have them more compliant. You also take care of the first family. I've actually met all these people here. Um, I love this one because George Bush was doing the little rabbit ears and Jerry Ford, <laughs> Ford thinking, I don't know if you should do that. When you think of presidents and the proximity of power, realize who they bring in. Who whispers in the president's ear? Who is the most powerful consultant? It's really the first spouse. It's the first voice the president hears every morning, the last voice the president hears every night. Okay? Who is that? And they're not elected, but it's who influences th that person. And we have something in the White House we call FaceTime. It's your currency in the White House, your reputation is only good as your FaceTime with the president. The president knows you, proximity. It's so important is who whispers and who influences the president's policies. Taking care of the organization, this was our Christmas photo uh, in 1999 at the White House uh, as I ran the medical unit. These are uh, Ar Army, Navy, Air Force, doctors, nurses, medics. We took care of not only the president, the vice president, and their families. We traveled with the first lady uh, to 
traveled with Tipper Gore. We had a clinic opposite that in the executive office building. Uh, since that time, the medical unit under my successors has grown and grown. I think there are up to 60 people now. So government got bigger, the mission got bigger, the organization got bigger. What did I learn from the White House after nine years there? If you're taking over a company, always see what your predecessor did before, okay? What did they do? It's always good if you follow a failure because you can always improve, right? And I learned a lot from the people before me, but learn from them. Learn what to do, but also learn what not to do because they're signaling that didn't work. Do something different. Learn from unexpected sources. There's very little continuity at the White House because what change of administration, when the, president, the new president sworn in on January 20th, he's up on Capitol Hill, back at the White House, back at the 18 acres of the White House, which you all paid for in D.C., there's transition going on even then. As the president's being sworn in, the South Lawn, there is a moving van that pulls up, and uh, things are being moved out, and then on the North Portico, things are booing, being moved in. So when the president comes back with the first lady to the second floor residence, all his stuff is there. The former president's things are moved out. So all that is going on. But then I realize, what do you learn from that? The people who stay aren't the, the political advisors. Your military are assigned for so many years. The people who stay, guess what, are your housekeepers. Your housekeepers who have been there 30, 40 years. Your butlers, your housekeepers. So when I got to the White House, I asked the, the butlers and the housekeepers who I knew, I said, because we took care of them, I said, what did you learn? You served five administrations. Democrats, Republicans alike, what, what do you learn? And they looked at me and say, honey, you just take care of whoever lives in this house. That's all we care about. You just take care of those people. So it was very good, good advice. The other thing that I learned is you don't always accept, we've always done it this way, okay? When you're in a big company, someone says, well, and you question policies and practices and things, and someone says, we've always done it this way. Ask them why. Is there a benefit? Tell me why you do that. Because that's the thing that if you want to change it, tell me why that's a reason that we should keep it if you, just because you've always done it this way. I spent nine years there, and it was an amazing time. It was time to move on. But I was only, I wasn't even 50. I was, think I was around 47, 48 um, when I left, retired from the Navy, and got recruited to Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. And people would say, oh my God, that was the height of your career. It was a great time. Now, you know, what do you do next? Well, you don't die. I mean, you, you know, you all run companies, you make millions of dollars, you do great things. That's not the end of your life. You know, Lord willing, if you have a doctor like me, you live in your 90s, your 100s, and you keep this going, you can do so many things. Life has so many opportunities. So I was at Mayo Clinic for four and a half years, and there I realized, you know, back in a big organization, and I kept wanting to do things my way. And when it doesn't quite fit with their way, you realize, I need to break out on my own. I need to go do something else. And so 11 years ago, last week, I left Mayo Clinic. I formed a private Qualsiers boutique practice. Uh, I've got 310 patients. Many, most of them are uh, retired business people, entrepreneurs, millionaires, billionaires, successful people who need good care. And I'm on call 24-7. You know, they email me, text me, see me, whatever. And then I do house calls. And I love it. It keeps me active in medicine. But the other thing, too, is we're not always about our job. We have personal lives. And sometimes, as you know, you've got things going on at home. You bring it to work. It's like, what's going on? And I was married for 29 years to my high school sweetheart. He was an attorney, the guy who, you know, didn't believe in me. And I decided as I was building my practice, I didn't want to go home anymore. I was busy enjoying, you know, life was good. I had a great practice, but I didn't have a good family life. So I parted amicably with him, and he's moved on uh, to remarry, and I moved on to marry a wonderful guy. Uh, about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, uh, one of my friends uh, was an author, and he said, you know, Connie, you need to write your book. You need to write the story of what you do at the White House. People write about it. And so he got me involved in pub publishing, and I got to do a fun book tour and working with the media. But let me backtrack a little bit about private practice. When I was spending that time at the White House following the president around, running the medical unit, providing care to the president and the first family, it struck me, wouldn't it be great to have a practice where you treated every patient as though he or she were the president of the United States with that type of respect? Wouldn't it be great to do that in private sector, try to build that model? And then as I started building my practice, I said, what principles can I institute in my practice to guide me and the people in my practice? And I looked at the, the symbol of a star 
And I was fortunate to retire with one star. If you looked at my uniform, I have a one star rear admiral. But all my patients are stars in their own way. Well, if you take the letters of the word star, I think of that as my star principle. And look at the letters. S is service. We're all in the service industry, right? We have clients, we have customers, we have patients. T is trust, that your word is good, you should come through with your deals, you'll honor your contracts, you'll honor your promises to your clients and your business associates. A in my field is important, it's access. I access 24 seven, patients call me all the time. That's about being accessible, and so are you. Accessible, your clients and your partners. R is relationship, you're only as good as your relationship with the people with whom you serve, that you're serving. But in business, I added two other R's that are very important. It's revenue. How many startups begin saying, okay, we're gonna do this startup and we're gonna go into business and we're gonna lose a lot of money? Nobody think of that. You wanna make a lot of money, you wanna prosper and you can do things with your money, hire people, build and, and do great things. The final R is your reputation and that is so important, that is your brand. What are you known for? So those are things I think are important. I talked about presidential care being accessed 24 seven, annual exams. Maybe my patients, I'm the last doctor. I have a patient who's 101, still going strong. My youngest patient's 24. Author, it's about having the time to write your story. Every single one of you has a, a book in you at least. Think of who out there needs to hear your story. It's a lot of fun to do that. I love talking radio and I'm very fortunate uh, about a year and a half ago I had a radio show on the Voice America Network, satellite radio. And actually, uh, Sandra Rogers is here. She's my executive producer. And I'm resurrecting my radio show, House Calls, uh, next year. And for all of you, it's the joy of communication. One of the things I love about this network, I buy my own time. I, I, have, no, I have no sponsors, so I own and can say whatever I want. And it's about, my theme this year will be about being positive and healing and regenerative of that sense. So I have great fun. I look forward to rekindling my radio show on Voice America Network. Personal life, uh, this is my second and last husband who uh, is a startup guy and we have wonderful times. This is actually in the, in the Reagan Library Pavilion with the former Air Force One that I've flown. But one of the messages is you're never too late to live happily ever after. Okay, think of that about changing your life. I'm blessed, I have two wonderful sons on the left. Uh, my oldest son's married. And then the love of my life is my 15-month-old granddaughter, which is fun, that's the best part. But the other project I'm working on is really longevity. And it's because of my other patients that I used to have the White House. Why do former presidents and their first ladies live so long? You know, you look at the blue zone studies of, 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 of civilizations and, and countries that people, we have larger groups of people live into their hundreds. Well, if you look at American presidents, they live pretty long. What is it that we can learn from them? And I'll share a little bit about presidential aging. Everybody says, oh my God, the before and after pictures, and the reason I show Bill Clinton is I know him the best, but the before and after pictures of presidents. They age from four to eight years in office. You know, by the time they're out, they're, you know, they're really pretty worn. But one of the perks of presidency is birthdays. You get lots of birthdays. You live a long time. George Herbert Walker Bush turned 92 this year. And this was on his 90th birthday when he jumped from the, uh, the airplane at Kenny Bunkport. Jimmy Carter was turned 92 this year, and that's despite brain cancer, which has been treated. So, uh, and the reason I talk about this, there are, and this is my next book, which I'm working on, The 11 Presidential Secrets to Longevity. How can you, what can you take from this that you can learn to live long? So that you can live the life you live, create the things you create, and have a long, good, active life. They all start with the letter P. Number one's purpose. What am I meant to do in this life? Number two is your partner. Make sure it's your biggest fan, somebody who elevates you. Three is prosperity. Now, why is prosperity such a good thing? Well, you can do the things you want to do with it. They give you access to good care. They give you quality of life. You're not starving. You know, you're doing the things that you really are impassioned to do. That's a big thing. Physical just means you're active. You're not sitting at a desk all day. You're moving, constantly moving. Portions, you know, you eat, eat, eat in moderation. I call it decadence and moderation. You watch your portions. Pet, the reason I put pet there, every president I know has a pet, a dog or a cat. I don't know whether Democrats have cats or Republicans have dogs. They have a pet, okay? And perhaps the fact that they have unconditional love from some source, they can look at them adoringly. It could be your spouse, but pets are good for that. Unconditional love is important. That's what they give you. 
Play is important. What do you do outside of work that's fun, that makes you laugh, that you resume the child, childlike quality of enjoying? Do something, at least one thing, that's fun for you that doesn't involve alcohol or drugs, okay? Do something fun. Protection is secret. They have Secret Service protection. You know, they, they don't drive crazy. You've got Secret Service protecting you. If there's any type of threat, they're there. They don't text. Well, they get driven and they can text, but they have somebody driving them. So what do you do? Make sure, you know, you play it safe. Protect yourself. Pulpit is important. That's your message. That's the bully pulpit. Before a former president becomes a dead president, he's a statesman. Former president so-and-so said, everybody listens. The same for you. As you go on in your careers, you become members of, a, you become chairman, you become members of board. People listen to your advice. And this says a lot about your legacy, what you teach, your people who follow you, how you change your industry. That's important. And in the end, when it's time to move on to the next entity, it's about peace. Are you at peace with the way you lived your life and the way you conducted yourself and what you've left behind? So with that, I just want to make it short and sweet. I wish you a great conference, a great time here to, to network and meet everybody. I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them after this. But thanks again, and have a great conference. Thank you.